Welcome to News Now on TV360. I am Thelma Okoro. The commander in charge of crushing the Boko Haram sect says the Nigerian army expects to seize Boko Haram's last few strongholds over the next few weeks. Major General Lucky Irabo, commander of the operation, said the jihadists were now holed up in a few pockets of the Zambisa forest. Zambisa forest is a major hideout of the Boko Haram sect. The jihadist group has carried out a seven-year insurgency in Niger's northeast. The army missed a de December deadline set by President Muhammad Buhari to wipe out the Boko Haram sect entirely. Now, despite the setbacks, Boko Haram still manages to stage regular suicide bombings in Nigeria and neighboring Chad, Niger and Cameroon. Since 2009, more than 15,000 people have been killed by Boko Haram, while 2.3 million others have been displaced by the insurgency. Members of advocacy group Bring Back Our Girls marched in the presidential villa in Abuja. Leader of the group Obia Zekwesele led the movement calling for the immediate release of the missing Chibo girls. She says President Muhammad Buhari's recent comment expressing his willingness to negotiate with the terrorist sect is not sufficient enough. In a recent video clip, the insurgents had demanded that their members held in detention by the federal government be swapped for the abducted girls. In April 2014, Boko Haram abducted 276 schoolgirls from a school in Chibok, Bornu State. Till date, most of the girls are yet to be found. The Nigerian Air Force says it has destroyed a new Boko Haram terrorist camp located in Bornu State, Northeast Nigeria. The Air Force, in a statement signed by its spokesperson, Group Captain Ayodele Famuyiwa, said the attack was carried out after surveillance intelligence reports showed survivors of an attack on August 20th converging at a new location. The new raid follows the previous attack on a Boko Haram camp, which, according to the military, fatally injured the disputed leader of the Boko Haram sect, Abubakar Shekau. According to the Air Force, the aim of the new attack is to clear the remnants of the sect, which is still located around Malam Fatori and Kargawa in Bonu State, northeast Nigeria. Nigeria has been battling Islamic sect Boko Haram for about seven years now. However, in the past few months, the military has succeeded in beating back the Islamic sect. Two people are confirmed to have died after a building collapsed in the Nigerian capital city of Abuja on Monday. Authorities have also announced the end of the rescue operations in the city. The four-story block went down on August 29th in Guarimpa Estate, Nigeria's federal capital territory, in the early hours of Monday morning. The building was still under construction when it came down. The acting coordinator of the Abuja Metropolitan Management Council, Safiyat Umar, explained that the building was standing on a flood plain which caused the building to collapse. She blamed the Federal Housing Authority for giving the approval for the construction of the building. FHA should not take the law into their hands and then decide to give building approval. They don't have the... the, the the professionals to control the, the, the buildings and uh, to supervise it. They are supposed to bring their drawings to uh, FCDA development control for proper vetting, enforcement and supervision. But unfortunately, we are running a running battle with FHA. FHA wants to be autonomous. FHA has decided to take the law into their hands. and. Uh, they gave this approval. This is a float, uh, a float place. And uh, if they have come to us with their layout, we wouldn't have allowed any building in this place because it's a float train. From the information we got from them, I spoke to the man, uh, MD myself. The MD said that they gave this developer approval to build a car park and one suspended floor. Unfortunately, the developer decided to build up to four-story building. At the point of building the four-story building, he violated by using substandard uh, materials. So they had the cause to give him stop work notice, but at each time he remedies it. And I asked him what type of remedy if such a thing will happen. If you have given him stop work notice, why didn't you inform development control 
Why didn't you invite development control? Government work is a synergy. Why, didn't you, why did you refuse to foster that synergy? Because you don't have the capacity to stop him. We have the capacity to stop him because we are the people that have the statutory right to control development. Nigeria has signed a key agreement with the United Kingdom to repatriate funds stolen by corrupt officials from the West African nation. The signing of the agreement is a follow-up to a deal reached at the London Anti-Corruption Summit held in May this year. Speaking after the signing of the deal, UK's Minister of State for Immigration, Robert Goodswill, said the Memorandum of Understanding will serve as a clear message to all seeking to have stolen assets overseas that there is no safe haven in the United Kingdom. While Nigeria's Attorney General of the Federation, Abubakar Malami, said the deal reflected the desire and willingness of both countries to continue cooperation and mutual support. The United Kingdom is also not the only one to have signed agreements with Nigeria to repatriate stolen funds. The U.S. and Switzerland have also signed similar agreements in the past. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg is in Nigeria. Zuckerberg arrived the country on Tuesday and visited Yaba in Lagos State, Nigeria's southwest region. Zuckerberg updated his Facebook followers on his trip to Nigeria, which is a business research trip. This is actually his first visit to the sub-Saharan region of the country of the continent. During his visit, Zuckerberg says he will be learning about the startup ecosystem in Nigeria. Experts say more people use Facebook in Nigeria than anywhere else on the continent. There are an estimated 16 million active users every month in the country, while 44% of them access Facebook every day. A new militant group known as the Niger Delta Greenland Justice Mandate says they have blown up a pipeline belonging to the Nigerian Petroleum Development Company, NPDC, in Delta State, southern Nigeria. The group in a statement said it attacked a pipeline in the region operated by NPDC and Nigerian energy company Shoreline on Tuesday. Recurring attacks on oil and gas facilities by militants in the Niger Delta region has cut the country's crude production by almost half. The attacks have also slashed output at a time when Niger is grappling with low global crude oil prices, which have hammered government's revenues and also weakened the Naira currency and pushed up inflation to nearly 11-year highs. Meanwhile, the MPDC is yet to comment on the recent attack. The Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, has threatened to embark on a nationwide strike action to press home its demands for the implementation of its 2009 agreement with the Nigerian federal government. The ASU Lagos Zone Coordinator, Olu Soji Showande, said this at a news conference held in Lagos. Showande said the union had, was planning this after several efforts to ensure that the government addressed the pending demands proved abortive. He said the 2009 FG and ASU agreement memorandum of understanding on funding of state universities, breaches of the conditions of service and renegotiation of the agreement were still pending. Minister of Information and Culture Lai Mohammed has said Nigeria will partner with the Republic of Sudan on creative cultural business and digital economy. Mohammed stated this when he received the ambassador to Sudan or in, to Nigeria, Ibrahim Bushura Ali, in his office in Abuja. The minister said it was high time the federal government of Nigeria and the Republic of the Sudan changed the concept of economic cooperation and stopped restricting its dealings to just buying of oil or selling of missionaries. I think it's about time that we change the concept of economic cooperation and we stop restricting economic cooperation to just buying of oil or selling of machineries. We should look today at a broader interpretation and meaning of economic cooperation. And I'm talking here about cultural and creative industry. And you see, the, the beauty of this cultural exchange and trying to look at the economy 
you know, in the, from the viewpoint of, you know, uh, culture and creativity, is that it helps in the employment of youth because the, la the, 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 the majority of the talent we're talking about is youth. It also helps our women to become much more employed than before. So I would very much welcome cultural exchanges between Sudan and Nigeria, not just uh, as a symbol of uh, the friendship between the two countries, but as a basis for economic uh, you know, development for both countries. I'm sure that the film industry in Sudan will have learned a lot to learn from our film industry, especially in Carnewood, because of the similarity of cultures. We all know also the big number of the Sudanese of Nigerian origin currently now live in Sudan, more than five million. So I always say in my meetings that what connect the Sudanese and the Nigerian peoples is blood, blood relationship. Yes, it is true that we may be far, as far as distance is concerned. We are not neighbors, but we are strongly, you see, connected and like by the kinship and blood relationship. And there are many, you see, uh, Sudanese of Nigerian origin is now in Sudan. They are Sudanese. They are in every corner. They are ministers. They are governors. They are businessmen. They are, they are everything. And they are contributing with their brothers in Sudan in building Sudan now. But let me say, Excellency, despite this very old relationship, economically, this relationship has to be, you see, uh, uh, revitalized. We have to put some emphasis on the economic cooperation because until now, we don't see tangible, you see, results in the economic arena as far as economic cooperation is concerned. As far as cultural, uh, as far as cultural cooperation is concerned, I think it is excellent because we have thousands now of uh, Nigerian boys and girls who are studying in Sudan in the Sudanese universities. They are very happy, and we are ready, you see, to offer more excellency in this field. Uh, in the context of the excellent relations between the two countries. The crisis rocking the People's Democratic Party assumed another dimension as a factional national chairman of the party, Senator Ali Modusheref rejected the decision of its board of trustees to hold another convention. The party's board of trustees, after a four-hour closed-door meeting on Monday, passed a vote of confidence on the Ahmed Makafi-led critical committee, mandating it to prepare for another convention. In Abuja. But the faction led by Senator Sheriff says the party's Board of Trustees decision was wrong. The Sheriff faction of the PDP gave fresh conditions for reconciliation, including that of dissolving the McCarthy led critical committee of the party. The PDP became divided after some members of the party at a national convention in Port Harcourt removed Senator Sheriff as a chairman of the party. The Nigerian presidency has listed the gains of President Muhammad Buhari's participation in the just-concluded Tokyo International Conference on African Development. One of such gains include the billions of dollars to be injected into African economies by Japan. A statement issued in Abuja by Garba Shehu, who is a presidential spokesperson, said the Japanese government had pledged to spend $40 billion to boost the African economies in the next four years. He gave the breakdown of the amount as $10 billion to be injected in the next 12 months, while the remaining $30 billion will be expended over a three-year period. Infrastructure such as roads, energy ports, hospitals, and training institutions will also be targeted in the investments. Civil society organizations staged a protest in Lagos State, Niger, Southwest region. More than 32 of these groups marched to the zonal office of the EFCC. They are demanding the prosecution of those involved in the budget padding scandal raging on in the Nigerian House of Representatives. According to the groups, members of the National Assembly have continued with business as usual in the face of the padding scandal and despite the anti corruption stand of the Buhari led administration. Today, we have come as registered members of registered organizations to present formally 
a written petition calling on the Economic and Financial Com Commission, EFCC, to sweep into action and investigate and when found guilty, prosecute everybody that may have been involved in the stealing of our Commonwealth through the padding of that 2016 budget. I present this petition on behalf of over 30 civil society organizations, on behalf of taxpayers that have no voice to you, to please take action. Please take action on this because Nigerian people are suffering. These few people cannot continue to reach against this nation. Thank you very much. Okay. So pardon the National Assembly, which some allegations have been raised against the speaker and some other persons. We are already received a petition from some other members of the public. And the investigation is being done in Abuja. Uh, when petitions are received, we look at them make some analysis, commence investigation. We do what we call preliminary investigation without inviting the accused person first. We carry out some investigations, gather some facts to ascertain the truthfulness of that petition. Where we find them indicted, then we go into inviting the accused persons. So what we are doing at present since we have already received some of the petitions, our men, our officers are already on ground, carrying out very thorough investigation. You've been watching TV360 News now. We'll take a short break and we'll come back we'll look at business and international stories. Don't go away. the volume of your music is too loud. And how is that your business? It is disturbing me. I can't sleep. And the same way you are disturbing my right to good music and where I enjoy it. Eh? What's wrong with you? Is there another person complaining? Uh, maybe we thought that uh, you have lost your mind. Are you, you having a party? I'm just respecting you, sir. Remember, I've paid my husband too. You will not understand why we are complaining because you do not care about other people except yourself. Look, the transformation we need in this country begins in this compound. Yes, now. From you, you, and I. This, your selfishness is an offshoot of corruption. Uh -huh. And corruption, not, not in, in my, my country. country. Oh, you know. Eh? Can you go, go to your bank? Oh. Corruption, not in my country. Welcome back. The Director General of the Industrial Training Fund, Dixon Onoha, says Nigeria can only fulfill its aspiration of becoming a member of the G20 through development of technology in the country. Onoha, who disclosed this on one Wednesday in Lagos, Southwest Nigeria, explained that smaller countries like Singapore and others were able to develop their people technologically. The G20 leaders are due to meet in China and to discuss issues affecting not just the members but the world. Nigeria will be hoping some positive things come out of the meeting that could help it get out of its recession. Ono, however, says Nigeria needs to build a workforce that is technologically compliant and also provides opportunity for evaluation and validation of skills requirements at the national and state levels. For us to join such, you know, GDG20, we need to, we cannot join G20 when our, you know, industrialization level is at the point it is now. We need to boost it. And one of the ways ITF is helping to boost it is through skills development. There can't be industrialization without skill, and I believe that is very clear to every one of us. All the countries that have that have made good advancement in industrialization are organizations that placed 
good emphasis and a lot of emphasis on skills development. Onoha explained that the agency is also considering the establishment of skill training centers that will provide university graduates the needed exposure to partially hands-on experience and contribute in reducing the rate of unemployment in the country, adding that the ITF is on course with its plan to create about 2 million jobs by 2017. Now to more business stories, Niger's gross domestic product GDP contracted by 2.06% in the second quarter. This is according to the Statistics Office on Wednesday. This has sent Africa's biggest economy into a recession after a decline in the first quarter. The Nigerian Bureau of Statistics says the non-oil sector declined due to a weaker currency while lower oil prices dragged down the oil sector. Outputs shrank by 0.6%. 36% in the first quarter of 2016. Nigeria is in the midst of an economic crisis triggered by a slump in crude oil prices, its mainstay which has hammered public finances and also the Naira and caused chronic dollar shortages. Crude sales account for around 70% of government revenues. The West African nation was last in a recession for less than a year in 1991 and experienced a prolonged one that started in 1982 and lasted until 1984. The Central Bank of Nigeria has recorded an inflow of $595 million into the country's foreign exchange reserves in just 72 hours. Nigeria has been battling low oil prices, which has seen its foreign exchange receipts fall from about $4 billion a month to less than $500 million per month. The CBN had employed various methods to rev up the re reserves, including a 16-month peg on the Naira exchange rate, with a majority of it amounting to a further depletion of the reserves in defense of the Naira. The gross external reserves at the end of the second quarter of 2016 stood at $26.51 billion dollars showing a decline of 3% and 6.5% compared with the levels in the preceding quarter and the corresponding period of 2015 respectively. Crude oil prices slid on Wednesday, though prices remain on track for a monthly gain of more than 10%. Brent's crude oil futures were trading at $48 per barrel, while U.S. crude futures was down 21 cents at $46.14 per barrel. Oil prices had rallied by more than 20% from the beginning of August this year, on hopes that producers were reviving talks on a possible output freeze, setting prices on course for their largest monthly gains since April this year. Analysts, however, say the focus has shifted to fiscal market fundamentals, which remain shaky. At least 22 people, including soldiers and civilians, were killed in Somalia's capital of Mogadishu on Tuesday. A car bomb claimed by Al-Shabaab militants exploded outside the presidential palace and also damaged two nearby hotels. More than 30 people were injured and rushed to the hospital following the attack. According to officials, one minister and some state radio journalists were injured in the incident. The hotel is visited mostly by government officials and police say they believe the facility was a likely target. UN Security Council diplomats are expected to visit South Sudan this week. A foreign affairs ministry spokesman on Wednesday said this without giving any details on the purpose of the trip. Fierce fighting in the capital of Juba last month has increased fears that the five-year nation could relapse into a civil war. This prompted the United Nations to authorize the deployment of the extra troops for the 12,000-strong UN mission already in the country. This month, the Security Council approved a 4,000-strong protection force for South Sudan's capital of Juba as part of the peacekeeping mission that had its mandate extended in July this year. Still on South Sudan, Zurelo Duwale, a 14-year-old journalist who has interviewed several presidents and prime ministers across the world, including the president of South Sudan, Savaki, now joins us on the line from her base in California to speak about the crisis in the country. Now, Zurel, as someone who has met and interviewed President Savaki, there is no doubt that you will be very interested in what's going on in that country. Can you give us your thoughts on the crisis in South Sudan? Well, thank you very much for having me on your show. You know, I actually watch it from here in Los Angeles, along with other channels like BBC Folks in Africa, you know, to try and get a balanced view on Nigeria and the African continent. 
So it's really cool. I actually really enjoy it. So, yeah, I do follow closely with what's been going on in South Sudan for many reasons. First, for those who don't know, South Sudan actually has the highest rate of girl marriage in Africa, where most girls by age 12 and 13 are married. It was the first reason that I wanted to meet with President Salva Kiir, and it was one of the very first things that I talked to him about. We were actually supposed to go there for a few programs, but then things changed with the Civil War. Now, Zuria, President Kiir has been projecting himself as a peacemaker and has consistently maintained that he has nothing against former Vice President Rick Marsha. As someone who has had the opportunity to interview the South Sudanese president, what kind of man would you say he is? I have to say that South Sudan is a very delicate case because it is a country with little infrastructure, a few leaders in charge, and a lot of oil. And that's a dangerous combination. Now, why is it dangerous? Because it allows mistrust to grow between tribes, groups, and factions who are tasting power for the very first time. And that's what's happening today. I really don't think that there can ever be trust now between President Salva Kiir and Vice President Machar. And as you may know, South Sudan is a tribe-driven society. And what makes things now more complicated is that President Salva Kiir's newly appointed vice president, who replaced Rek Machar, has been rejected by the elders of the newer tribe, which is where former Vice President Machar comes from. So things are definitely not going to settle anytime soon. Now, if I was being asked to advise, I would recommend that both leaders agree to step down and hand over to the elders in the country for like one or two years while peace is made and new elections are held. But that's just how I see things, and I'm only 14. Well, Zuriel, thank you very much for your time. Now to sports stories now. The Nigerian Football Federation, NFF, has admitted that it had issues when it came to paying its under-23 coach, Samson Siasi, at the five-month salary that it owes him. Siasi could decide that won Nigeria's only medal at the just-concluded Rio Olympic Games. They took bronze after beating Honduras 3-2 in, in the tournament. After the competition, his contract with the NFF ended and he demanded the outstanding money. But the NFF Secretary General Mohamed Sanusi says his organization does not have the money to pay Siasia. The NFF says problems with the country's treasury single account is the major reason behind its failure to pay Siasia. German coach Jerno Rohr has officially taken charge of the Nigerian Super Eagles. The team began training sessions this week ahead of Saturday's 2017 AFCON qualifier against Tanzania. The match is a dead rubber as both teams are out of the qualifying race. It takes place at the Aquaibom International Stadium in Uyu on Saturday, September 3rd, 2016. The Eagles will miss the 2017 AFCON for the second successive time after failing to defeat the Pharaohs of Egypt in the two matches played in March this year. The English Football Association has charged Manchester City striker Aguero with one count of violent conduct following his behavior during City's 3-1 victory over West Ham on Sunday. The incident happened in the second half of the game as the Argentine appeared to elbow West Ham defender Winston Reid. All of the ball incidents, which are not seen at the time by the match officials, are referred to a panel of three former elite match officials. Each panel will review the video footage independently of one another to determine whether they consider it a sending of offence. Aguero has until 7 p.m. on Thursday, September 1st, to reply to the accusation. Well, that's all we have on news now. We thank you very much for watching. I am Thelma Okoro.